this is the challenge of a YouTuber, which is, uh, you know, pushing that record button and actually filming something because you never know, are people gonna hate it? Or, you know, is it good enough? Uh, have you thought through what you're gonna say? I have not thought through what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Okay, so um, I want to talk about the question of why is it that right now, when it is really easy to get access to facts and information, where you can just pull up your phone and look up anything in the world, why is it now that we have the most access to facts, do facts mean the least? This is what I want to know. Why does fake news spread now? Why are we more polarized now than ever before? And what I have to kind of admit to you is that I was a real optimist. Maybe I was naive about the internet, but my thinking about having an international communication system whereby anyone anywhere can share anything and anyone anywhere, regardless of say their education background or their class standing can get access to real information through Wikipedia, okay? My thinking was the internet was going to make everyone happier and more informed, more educated, uh, and, and probably more tolerant of others around them. And the reason why I think that the internet should make people more tolerant is because it should expose people to people who are not like them, right? I mean, is this, is this crazy? My thinking is that like, as we have a platform to communicate with each other, people in diverse places, people with different interests from us, uh, and we all have the ability to sort of debate and agree upon what is true, we all would become more accepting of the facts. Maybe I'm ranting on about this too much. Is this too much? No. <laughs> okay, so, we can edit, we can edit. So, I guess, <laughs> the point is, in summary, I thought, that the, um, I thought that the internet would make the world more connected, more tolerant, more educated, and more true, like more agreed upon the facts and the way things are. And for a while, I think there were signs that this was happening. There was the Arab Spring where, you know, people in countries that had been kind of dictatorships or people who had been oppressed were rising up. There was the approval of uh, gay marriage in a number of countries. There were agreed upon uh, climate agreements uh, that seemed to suggest the whole international community was coming together. There uh, are things like my YouTube channel where there can be four million people who can watch or subscribe to a channel that's about information and about learning new things about the universe, right? The whole rise of smart content on YouTube, I took as an indication that things were going in the right direction. That here we can get communities together uh, who are all interested in the same sort of, in the same quite high level phenomena. You know, the same, like if, if I made a TV show, I could never convince anyone to uh, make a, an episode about interpretations of quantum mechanics. I could never convince someone to make a video about pilot wave theory and go in as much depth as I went into in my videos. But on the internet, you can find that audience because you can aggregate across the whole world. So little niche audiences across every country can all come together and say, you know, we wanna learn this and we uh, can support this sort of enterprise. You guys in agreement? Okay, now here's the problem. What I didn't think about was that other communities can form. Communities where people have particular agendas, ideological or religious, or you know, people with extreme biases. Normally, they're not much of a force to reckon with because they are dilute in our populations. But on the internet, just like the people who love physics, people who hate science, or uh, people with, with differing ideologies, and people who are intolerant can find each other, and they can come together into these camps. So I think that starts to suggest why we have the problem that we have today. And then what do people do once they've found their communities, once they've found their people? Well, we have meetups, but we also, we share things with each other online. And you can think about some communities that are really innocuous, like 
the communities of people who are cat lovers, who love sharing like pictures of kittens, and then someone gets the idea to write like a really cute phrase, like I can have cheeseburger on a picture of a kitten, and then that little image tickles our brains in a way that is really strong and really incredible, and then that spreads throughout the internet. And what you have, in essence, is kind of evolution taking place, an evolution of ideas on the internet. And so I guess what I mean is, you know, one person can post this picture of a cat and then people can vary the phrases that are on it and the, the best phrase is going to win out and get itself replicated and shared across the web more than any other. And the same thing happens with ideological arguments, right? If, if there's some sort of debate that's happening on the internet, different versions of arguments can pop up. And when you think about two groups on the internet debating, they're not really debating each other. Each community creates what they think the opponent's argument is. And then people within that community can tweak that argument to make it worse and worse and worse, to make it the, the most awful version of itself that pushes our buttons. And when it pushes our buttons, then we share it with everyone we know. And we say, look at what the other side is talking about. Look at how, how awful it is. And, and we keep evolving the ideas to make them really, really bad. Those are the ones that, that get shared and spread just like in evolution. We are evolving arguments to make them the worst form of themselves and then to make the, the pushback, you know, even worse. And that I think is leading to this polarization. And what's worse, the internet is organized by algorithms. Algorithms that are designed to take the things that are most engaged with. Most, that, that most push our buttons, that get us going and get us sharing and liking or hating, and they promote those even further. And this, I think, is where something like fake news comes in. How is it possible that during the last election cycle in the US, more fake news was spread and shared than real news? That is extraordinary. And I think it happens because the internet allows groups of people to come together who have really particular views. It allows them to share things with each other, even sharing what they think the opponent's argument is, tweaking it ever so slightly, doing all of these little mutations, little alterations, and finding the ones that push our buttons the most. And then those are the ones that get shared. Those are the ones that get liked and hated and everything. And those are the ones the algorithm elevates to the very top. So rather, the, rather than the internet bringing us together, rather than us converging around the facts, instead, the internet allows us to divide ourselves into factions and to have this crazy evolution of arguments which is facilitated by the algorithms pushing us ever further apart. And that is the, the, the best that I've been able to reason about why we now care less about facts than we ever did before. Because deep down, each one of us is based on confirmation bias. We naturally go out into our world and we seek things that agree with what we think, rather than looking for things that disagree with what we think. That's an innate human trait. As you can see in my video, Can You Solve This? <sighs> so it's upsetting. And uh, I think we need to find a way to overcome this division and find a way to uh, agree again on what is truth and what is not. Thank you. All right, all right. So, uh, questions. Anyone want a question or comment? We have a gentleman down the front. Yes. Um, you know that term has a word, cyber balkanization. I learned it from Visa. It's a very useful term. These, Say it again. The, cyber vulcanization? Balkanization. Balkanization? Yeah, sort of the, spl the splinter net. You know, everything's sort of... The splinter net. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> cyber... Balkanization. I don't know what balkanization is. Well, I guess it has to do with the political situation in the Balkans at some point. Oh, sure. cyber balkanization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shout out to CGP Gray's video here. He has this idea that uh, you should uh, 
try, you should uh, think of your opinions uh, like papers in a box. And if you find uh, another opinion that is better than the opinion that you have in the box, you should switch, switch it out. You should not uh, believe us. You are not your opinions. Your opinions are just like stuff you carry with you. And that should be easily changed. It's a very good point. I also, I should cite CGP Gray's video about the evolution of ideas, because I was strongly influenced by that video. I think it's one of his, his best and most important videos. Yes? Um, so we have this mechanics that uh, evolves strong ideas that uh, polarize people. Do you think there's a way to utilize this a mechan mechanic to make the internet better, to bring us all together, to not being pushed around by it by utilizing it to better stuff? Right. I mean, I personally think that the mechanics that's brought us here to division is not in its current form going to lead us to convergence. So I think something has to change about the mechanics. And if I think about one of these options, right, who was uh, saying about the ideas that being the paper and you should really swap them out? That's a very sophisticated, mature idea, right? It's very sophisticated and mature to think that we can have our beliefs set down and then when they get challenged, we can think about them and, and swap them out for new ones. That's not something that humans like to do. It's hard. It's hard. I was um, recently in the Netherlands and the guy who was driving this van, we were going around shooting a TV series, guy who was driving the van talked to me about electric cars. And he was saying to me, Derek, you know that even if you get like a low emissions or a zero emissions car, an electric car, half of the emissions of any vehicle come from the production of the vehicle in the first place. So really, if you think you're cutting down a lot of the emissions of your vehicle by getting an electric car, which, full disclosure, I do have, uh, <laughs> he's saying you're, all, you're not really you know, dramatically decreasing the emissions because still half the emissions happen when the car was made. So a better strategy than buying all electric cars would be to not buy any cars at all and just keep driving your cars a few years longer because that's going to save a lot more because you know, a lot of the waste is up front. And I did not believe him. I was like, that is crazy. Half the emissions, half, like I know it's hard to make a car, but half the emissions? And you think it's gonna drive for, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of kilometers? And I went and I looked it up and it was true. And I take his piece of paper and I swap it in and I move mine out. But I think it's a really hard thing to do. And it's something that like I felt repulsed by, like I didn't want to swap my piece of paper out. That's why I think, I don't know that that can be the solution wholesale because we can't just say to everyone, hang on, a lot of you have beliefs that are not true. Can we just swap some paper out with you? They'll say, no, that's my paper. Um, so I was going to say, to me, the thing that needs to change, I would say, is some of the systems and particularly the algor algorithms because I think Facebook, and I think they are looking at this now, needs to figure out a way not to elevate fake news but to let it languish and promote real news. They have a responsibility because they are curating the feeds of a billion people around the world. They have the responsibility to make sure those feeds are not misleading. And that is something that they were um, bad about doing in the last, uh, last election. Yeah. If you're uh, determined to find the real news, you go out on a marathon of research and usually you dig deeper and deeper past the sort of junk that's being catered to us by the algorithms. But what you're essentially proposing is some sort of a lie detector to be implemented in algorithms. That's kind of hard to do, right? Unless it's manually altered by uh -oh, uh -oh. companies <laughs> like Facebook. I, I don't think you can manually alter the algorithm. I, I think you have to find a way, and I think the algorithms can be made. I think it's a big challenge. I agree with you. But I think there's a way to do it. I mean, if you look at Google search results, there's constantly people trying to game what Google's doing. But you don't end up with fake news sites at the top. You don't end up with spam sites coming up top in the Google search results. That's because they battled and battled and battled to find these signals that, that separate what's a valuable site, what's a site that people appreciate and, and seems to be linked into a whole bunch of other sites which are all part of a factual web, right? And I think that similarly, Facebook needs to do something like that where in essence, they look for signals of truth. I agree, very hard, and it's gonna be a constant battle but I think you need to look for the signal of truth rather than just the signal of what pushes people's buttons. Yeah? Uh, I, I really like your point about Facebook because I feel like if you look back at like the Stone Age, if you had a weird opinion and you were in your little tribe, either you convinced everyone or you changed your mind, right? So, you know, Facebook is kind of like our tribe, right? So 
some people use Facebook as more like, oh, these are my acquaintances, but a lot of people use it like, these are my close friends. And if a close friend says something weird about, about something on Facebook, you comment, right? You have a discussion and you know, you don't say, no, you're wrong. I'm not going to talk to you anymore, right? Because he's your friend. So either you change your mind or you convince the other person, right? But if you go on like Reddit, you're not going to convince like 10 million billion people. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe like if you've ever like tried the controversial tab on Reddit, that's usually where some of the most interesting <laughs> discussions are. But yeah, sometimes it's not so fun. And uh, I think this brings me to one of my kind of points that I think is a little bit counterintuitive. And it's a point that's difficult for me to think about. I, I, I'm still not settled on this idea, but I wonder if sometimes that arguing just makes things worse. You know, and as someone who makes science films, I wonder, like, if I go out and make a, a film about something that's controversial, I don't know if maybe I'm just making it worse. And so I, I think we all have to think about that really carefully before we engage in discussions, which is, is there a chance by making these points, which you think are really clear and really get at the truth, is it possible that you were just causing the other um, side to be more deeply entrenched in their beliefs in the first place? Down here, yeah. Do you think that adapting algorithms to identify true statements can have some issues with like separating true or like uncontroversial <laughs> statements from contro controversial that um, what's uncontroversial will more likely seem true. Something. Yeah, I get you there. I, as I say, I don't know the solution. I think it is hard, but I do think we have to figure it out. I think that there are places on the web that have a good record of truth. Wikipedia, for example, for all of its ability to be edited, is still more likely than not to be true. So I think there's all these places that do signal true things. I think, you know, CNN is more likely to be true than Breitbart News. So, I mean, <laughs> there has got to be some signal in the noise, some way to trace back references and things, right? Some of the things we talked about were... Um, Some of the things we talked about were manual intervention or, or deeply searching, right? Going back and looking at all these different sources. That's something that most humans don't do and won't do and can't do, don't have the time to do. That's where I'm saying a machine can look at references. A machine can look at uh, signals that spread, you know, and they, and they can do that very rapidly. So you want to find out who are these people? Do they have a record of, you know, false, are they, are they actually accredited? Are, are they at a in university? There's, there's a, a variety of things that you can do to see whether things have, have a truth signal or not. I don't think it's easy, but I, I think it's possible. Yes. There are traditional news medias that may, uh, uh, present the news or these articles, fake or not, to the public, don't you think they sort of have part of the uh, blame because they fact checked those fake articles when the results already were in? Like all these statements were said, and then when uh, the results were in, say in the last election, they just went, oh, wait. Uh, these statements, were they true? <laughs> oh wait, they weren't, but <laughs> too late to alter the results from false statements. Yeah, but I think there was a lot of live fact checking, but it didn't seem to do anything. Like people didn't seem to care about facts. And that deep down is the, is the real question I want to get the answer to, which is like, why don't people seem to care what's true? And I guess maybe rather than putting it that way, there were different camps which each had their own narratives and their own things that they believed was true and that was different from the other side. And so figuring out what true was was, was really hard, especially if you were completely in one camp. I mean, mm. there, were, there were fake things around on both sides. Yeah. 